It's the zoom. Okay, great. All right, all right. Thank you, everybody. I mean, the still the students are joining. It's the zoom. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, so I, I suggest we wait two more minutes and we start, June. Mm -hmm. yeah, no problem, Ana Maria. I, I will be listening to your voice. <laughs> <laughs> great. I mean, the last lecture, there was a lot, a lot of questions. So instead, it, it ran like 20 minutes late, unfortunately. Um, oh, that's good. You have lots good. of questions. It's good, yes, it's good. But then, then we, um, we, in principle, delayed it a little bit. The yours, um, uh, but I think students. This was, are... this was extra supposed to be. So, <laughs> I don't yes, even... the advantage is that it's a little bit shorter. It's only one hour, so so it's okay that. Uh, hof hopefully, it's okay. Um, I mean, yeah. So it's. But I think we, we should not delay your time, June, because your time is precious. So let me wait one more minute and we start. We could also just have conversations with students. <laughs> so <laughs> <without> <laughs> having lectures. Yeah, that, that, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, the point is that we are not having a critical mass. We have 28 people joining. So, but I mean, it's true that it's going to be a stream live in, in YouTube. What's the, yeah, I remember the last two lectures when I was talking about molecules, we had a, something like a 45 or, I forgot. 45 people, yes, around 45, 48 people. So we, we told them we were going to start a little bit later at 11.10, that was the starting time, but it's already past the starting time, so. Um, so I think yeah. So I we we now have thirty. So so maybe it's it's, it's a good time to start. So um, we we have to thank June very much for um, the opportunity to give one extra lecture. Um, so we are going to make it a, a little bit shorter, so you don't have um, a lot of information today. Um, but uh, then June is going to tell us about a clock, quantum matter, and fundamental physics. Um, and as you know, well, feel free, this is a, an iterative discussion, so uh, feel free to ask questions um, during the lecture. So sometimes it's easier if you really uh, discuss yourselves, I would, I will try to pay attention to the chat too. Jun, thank you so much and, um, and please go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you, Ana Maria. Um, actually, you can see my laser pointer, right? Um, and I will again rely on you if there are questions coming from the uh, from students. Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get. So we should aim for forty five minutes. Forty five right? minutes and hope. I mean, yes. So uh, I mean, the idea is at the least to let fifteen minutes for questions. So to cover an hour, but ideally we have at the least yeah. fifteen minutes for discussion. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, uh, we'll get started. So. Um, maybe conversation is more important than actual going through all the slides, but it, I did cut it short to, to, to be able to fit into about 45 minutes and telling you a little bit of the modern uh, atomic clock, how that connects to quantum science and why quantum information processing and precision metrology and quantum sensing, they are all part of the same family of quantum technology. Uh, and th this, let me just put this way, clock had advanced over the last decade by more than five orders of magnitude. When do you, in physics, you think, well, things can evolve so fast? It really tells you there's a, this epoch of new understanding new technologies coming. And, and, it, and I think this connection to quantum physics, to quantum antibody physics, precision metrology is at this most productive stage. And I think that's reflected in the rapid progress of atomic clocks. So clocks is all about you know, understanding quantum coherence, using that for precision measurement. And as we are now working on involving entangled quantum states, you want the system to have long coherence time. And that's all about quantum system design that you have heard in the summer school. You want to be able to reach the standard quantum limit. So the more quantum particles you put in there, the better you can achieve your precision. 
And it later on with entanglement, you certainly hope to go even beyond that. And as well as you need to understand these atoms will interact with each other. So many body, many body physics will be part of that metrology story. And you, you needed to understand it so that you can protect the quantum coherence and protect the enhancement you hope to achieve. So, so this connection of precision measurement frontier, where emphasis on precise quantum state preparation, quantum coherence, quantum measurement, optimization, and so on, versus the quantum science um, entanglement resources, system engineering and application oriented uh, system development, really meeting together right now as we speak. And I think uh, the past decade of the rapid, rapid, you know, in a progress on clock is not slowing down, not yet. It will still go on for a few more years with this rapid progress. And I think that's very exciting because build, being able to build the most precise instrument the humankind has ever been able to do will allow you to open your chapters for scientific discovery. There's almost certain. And as you look down deeper into the microscopic side of the world, you will understand better how things connect uh, to the deep science, for example, and some of the mysteries out there. So um, let me uh, the atoms I'm going to use, I tell you today is a strontium atom. It turns out you can, you can look it up in the periodic table. It's in the so-called group two, has two valence electrons. Those two valence electrons can form spin singlet or spin triplet. Therefore, in the energy level diagram, you can see the two families. One is a spin singlet family, the other one spin triplet family. Normally, they don't cross over because electronic spin is supposedly uh, preserved. Uh, but a singlet, uh, singlet triplet, when they cross over, it's called a um, uh, combination transition, which is relatively weaker strength in, compa in comparison to transitions happening within spin singlet or spin triplets. But in strontium, <coughs> it's actually a good example of uh, telling that story because in the spin singlet, if, for example, the 461 nanometer, that's the lowest ground, the, the ground state and the, one of the lowest excited, electronic excited state in the spin singlet is a single P1. That transition is very broad, you know, uh, heavily favored, uh, and it has a transition line with uh, some 32 megahertz. So it's a very broad transition, meaning its photon scattering rate is uh, extremely fast. On the other hand, if you cross over to the so-called intercombination transition where you have a spin, electronic spin has to flip from triplet to singlet. The same P1, but now that has a three triplet indicating it's a triplet, the, uh, the transition uh, strength goes down by a factor of 1,000, or 10,000 almost. You know, the transition language becomes 7.4 kilobits. And yet there's another transition, a triple P0. This is a a transition which is normally speaking uh, totally forbidden from quantum mechanics because you're going from J equal to zero to J equal to zero. I think Anna Maria Ray is going to give a talk on SUN symmetry and so on. Can tell you the reason why the symmetry, uh, the mixing of triple P zero with other upper line electronic states break the symmetry because of the underlying nuclear spins in, in the fermionic atoms of, of strontium 87 that allowed this atomic transition of 698 nanometer to be of line width of a millihertz. And this is a line, line width, line, this is the transition that we're using for building atomic clock. So the triple P zero enjoys a very long lifetime. And if you put your atom in a coherent superposition between single S zero state and triple P zero state, you have a very long coherence time. And this, the system is actually field insensitive because J equal to zero total angular momentum of electronic angular momentum is zero and so on. So, so now if nothing else, you should remember this number, quality factor of 10 to the 17. This is a tremendously high quality. Quality factor describes if you put a system in coherent superposition of oscillations, it will oscillate until it decays away. And the, the, the ratio of the number of oscillations during the lifetime is the so-called quality factor. And typical, you know, if you get your music fork out, the quality factor of a thousand, considered as a very good music fork. Mm -hmm. Quartz oscillator would have us a quality factor of a million. So we're talking about huge quality factors. And this maybe allow you to actually build even a better intuition of what this quality factor means. 
<laughs> you can think about the time scales of our natural universe. The universe has a 10 to the 18 second lifetime so far. Um, electronic states such as a strontium has electrons moving around the nuclear uh, nucleus, and the period is often can be qualified as you know time scales of a femtosecond or 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And you take geometrical mean of these two extreme values. One governs the microscopic world of evolution. One governs the macroscopic world of evolution. The time scale is on the order of 30 seconds, the geometrical mean. And the strontium atom happens to have that kind of coherence time at a, a comparable to this geometrical mean of electronic oscillation along nuclear versus the entire universe's time. And, and therefore, you know, this is considered as an excellent pendulum with a quality factor of 10 to the 17. If you can bridge that kind of a quality factor, you should be able to go all the way down to the microscopic world, being able to measure every single period of electronic evolution around the nucleus or along the entire universe and then not losing a second over the entire age of the universe. And that's where we are. We want to use this particular quantum pendulum to build atomic clock. And the, when you have systems like this, it will be a, a fantastic probe for fundamental physics. You can use clocks to directly measure gravitational waves. And that's not so far away in terms of the measurement position now we are reaching at the level that you can touch on gravitational waves. The real challenge is how do you move clocks like this out of the laboratory and put it in space? You might be able to sense the space-time curvature with atoms layer by layer. You have heard now plenty of talks of having atoms or molecules in confining optical lattices or tweezers. And you may start to have to worry about the curved space-time when you describe the uh, many body evolution of these quantum systems. And there are deep uh, mysteries out there like dark matter. Clock might be uh, uh, one of the key technologies that allow you to see the possible really, really feeble coupling between dark matter and ordinary matter or field beyond gravitational interaction. Right now, the only evidence we have about dark matter is through astronomical observations, through the gravitational effect. There is no other con you know, interaction between dark matter and ordinary matter. We would love to see that, that connection you know, through uh, various different sectors of uh, probing fundamental constants and so on. And maybe for the technology ad advanced, if we have a network of such clocks in space and a form a long baseline interferometer of it, this will be, become the gigantic telescope, you think Hubble telescope has a big aperture of a telescope. If you connect satellites flying millions of kilometers apart, and yet you can maintain the distance between them to be a fraction of a wavelength, you can connect these optical signals together between different satellites and become a gigantic telescope looking deep into the universe, or look back down on the earth, understanding geophysics, understanding climate change, you know, obviously, we are, uh, the summer seems to be getting hotter and hotter. And, uh, and in Boulder, we are still fortunate, still relatively cool. But there are many parts of the world is getting really hot. <laughs> and we may need a clocks to help us understand in a more uh, controlled manner uh, what's going on with the geophysics and so on on Earth. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, over the, if you look at this historical chart of atomic clock, after World War II, the blue dots represent the atomic clock, clock that defines the time. That's why we are all on the Zoom at this particular time. Uh, it, it, you know, these atomic clocks were made by microwave uh, technologies uh, using cesium atom, uh, hyperfine interactions of cesium atom to build a clock. And that evolution has, has been remarkably successful over the past few decades, all the way down to 2010 where the, the, you can see the pro progress has been nearly one decade of performance enhance, enhancement over one decade of a real human time. And, 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 and get, get to the point of 10 to my 16 level of accuracy. But since 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, the optical atomic clock has quickly taken over, taken over and this progress has continued uh, to be moving forward. Since, uh, since the talk is relatively short, I think this actually big picture, uh, sort of letting you be excited about 
what's going on right now? You know, this is one of the most exciting physics I can tell you for sure. Okay, I'm biased a little bit, but look at other areas of physics. When do you see in five years, do you see progress go up by several decades? It, it usually doesn't happen. Okay, this indicates a new quantum, new technology revolution. And this is going to continue. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, the high Q quality optical transitions, new laser stabilization techniques, ultra cold atoms technologies, optical frequency combs, almost the, the um, over the, another way to say this is, you know, over the past 20 years, 30 years, there have been four or five, I don't remember, Nobel prizes given to AMO physics. Every one of those Nobel prize winning technology is not being involved in those clocks. And that's because the science is just moving so fast. As soon as something new, new ideas came, has been now evolved into building a better meteorological system. I think there has been 11 Nobel Prize Junes, no? Since 1997, 11. <laughs> it's amazing. 11. Nobel Prize, as if you count in theories and experimentalism in EMU related since 1997. <laughs> Okay, 11. Okay, I did actually didn't realize that. Mm. It's amazing, yes. And all related in some degree to clocks, I think. Mm -hmm. And so current accuracy has now achieved 10 to minus 18. The measurement precision is 10 to minus 19. I said it today, but that was that was a slide that was made earlier this year and and actually did, forgot to update. This, this number is no longer right. You know, that precision is reaching already low parts, two times 10 minus 20. So it's this prediction of going to 10 minus 20 and beyond, it's already in the happening as we speak um, right now, right in this building. Uh, I guess you are not in the building, we are all over the place. Um, so uh, so b before I, just because I want to give you the survey and if you're interested, you can, you can study this a little bit further. You know, one of the key enabling technologies is stable lasers and if you can, because light is where we communicate with atom, right? So you have heard so much in AMO conferences about these the interaction between light and the matter. The light is where the atom communicate with us. So in order to control the light, uh, in order to control the atom, you want to make make sure the light that you use to control the atom is made at the at the stability level where the quantum pendulum is swinging at. So, so some of the new technologies has come up. For example, we make optical interferometers formed by an, an crystalline material like silicon cool down to a temperature where thermal expansion coefficient vanishes crossing zero. So the system is incredibly stable, is limited only by the fundamental Brownian noise associated with non-zero temperature of a, of a mechanical device. The same, the same physics that governs the LIGO, uh, so, so called a thermal noise. Using that kind of technology, you have made words most stable lasers ever. You know, this is a beating between two different lasers showing a line width of eight megahertz or so, which indicates a coherence time only a fraction, you know, approaching a minute. A small fraction, it's not as small anymore, it's a significant fraction of distance that light travels, the time in light travels between Earth and the Sun. So just tell you the scale, you know, the Sun and Earth distance is called an astronomical unit. And the scale of the coherence length of the laser is not approaching an astronomical unit. And such control also comes from, and I give you a sort of an introduction of the light. You know, you have the, the, the light comes spans over many, many decades in, in the radio frequency microwave all the way to the ultraviolet X-ray in this electromagnetic spectrum. The visible spectrum co covers a very small portion of it, but and, and the laser we use ha happens to be at a, this 600 and a six, a 700 nanometer and then a dot, little dot, and it's a very very po small portion of electromagnetic spectrum, right? That's a laser, a single frequency laser, and this laser is is a device that you use to watch DVD, you know, watch the videos. And that's the laser right, right there, but the laser line was is way too broad, and we need to zoom in. Uh, a million times from the visible spectrum to the laser. And after that million times zooming in, the laser line was still a few gigahertz, still way too broad. And, and took pioneers such as people like Jane Hall, Ron Driver, and so on. These are the technology that went into the LIGO. They've been working on this since 1970s. And this is one of the early 
cavities that Jan Hall built in Jella that are using ultra low expansion glass that they, they were able to in the early 90s, early 80s and 90s, they were able to reach uh, another factor of a million from a gigahertz down to a kilohertz. And that's still not enough. And that needs another really a factor of a million now to, a, to the modern day where we can now talking about millihertz scale line with on, on the optical transitions. And so this control of the light has advanced quite a few factors since the laser was invented over the last 60 years. So that stable lasers really can boast this amazing coherence that we have that can use this to control the quantum pendulum. Meanwhile, as I emphasized, the control of the light seems to be at the very, very small spectral window. And yet the entire electromagnetic spectrum spans many decades outside of the visible light. But fortunately, using this tool called a frequency comb, that allow you now connect from a single very, very stable laser frequencies out to any uh, parts of the spectrum then a model lock lasers can cover. And some through nonlinear optics and so on, we can uh, extend the frequency comb into the infrared and also into the ultraviolet. So you can think of this as a digital synthesis of the electromagnetic spectrum using very precise quantum control. So in another way of saying, Atomic clock is not just a timepiece anymore. It's 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 allowing you to control the synthesis of the, the electromagnetic spectrum in the most precise way. And that's something that you should, you know, if you're a spectroscopist, you will say, yeah, I can use anybody's atomic clock now to, to, to drive my spectroscopy system, right? So this is a very enabling uh, technology, you no longer have to worry about the wavelength and so on. You just worry about the frequency of your light. So with all uh, that, may I comment something that just to connect with your prior lecture? Lecture that it was thank you to the frequency com that uh, Jun's group and David Jin's at the time were be a were able to actually do the stir up of the molecules. So the, this technology was the one of the hard, I mean, it took many, many more years to scientists to actually be able to cool down molecules. And, and the, the key is that the synergy between the, the comb technology into the molecule, the things that Jung was there in both experiments that allow and facilitated such developments in the molecule. So it's just connecting different fields, even though you don't see it right away. Yeah, thank you, Anna Maria. That's an excellent point uh, to connect those different lectures together. And that's why a AMO science in many ways is so exciting. Like AMO, they all have to be together. You cannot separate them out. <laughs> and they advance together. It's in, in an amazing way. And of course, AMO right now is, of course, is also interacting with Many body physics. That's why you're talking with this border summer school is a many body is a is a condensed many body condensed matter physics summer school. But AMO is now playing an important role and a fearing back and forth between condensed matter and AMO science and quantum. So June, can I ask you something about the calm? Oh, hi, Leo. Hi. So just to put some numbers on it. So can you say like let's say you want to go to microwave you're using a visible stabilized you know frequency to go all the way to microwave so how many delta functions are there like how many you know teeth in the comb are there yeah like to like excellent point so and what what's the spacing etc yeah the spacing is a is a what's what's nice is a sort of a very flexible we can make a spacing few hundreds of megahertz, few tens of megahertz, few gigahertz, few tens of gigahertz, and you can select those spacings. Therefore, as Leo alluded to, if you pick any of these combs and you let them beat on a photo detector, you can already generate a microwave immediately. The, the frequency spacing between these combs are microwave, and you can take harmonics of those spacing. So in many ways, uh, right now, the best microwave signal, and this is a kind of amazing uh, thing to say, Microwave has been here since World War II. It's a very mature technology. The best microwave source right now comes from this frequency comb driven by the optical atomic, like the silicon cavity, because that's the best quantity kill ever made, better than any microwave resonator can produce. So if you want to get the best microwave signal, 
what you want is to connect a laser that's very, very stable and use this frequency comb to subdivide into microwave frequency. And that's the best signal. So but the, in terms uh, of, yeah. I you, were, Leo, you were asking how many comb components are there. Typically, yeah, there like are mi yeah. millions of comb components. Millions of, okay. And the spacing, if I understand correctly, the spacing between those comb, those teeth and that comb is uh, uh, just the one over the, it's, it's one over the time it takes to, of your cavity, right? It's, it's the Wrong length trip. divided by speed of light, round trip time in your cavity. Is that, is that what the frequencies spacing is? Roughly speaking, yes, that's correct. But then okay. through the mode locking, you made sure that, that regardless of where your color is, you know, people start to worry about dispersion. But actually the mode locking allow you to make sure regardless of your color, your propagation speed is always the same. The repetition rate is always the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And finally, is the, so is the, if I go all the way to micro, if I go like millions of these components down from the visible, are those, you know, are those, uh, you know, frequencies as sharp as the, those peaks are sharp as the visible because they're locked or are yes. they still degrade? You know, are no, they... We we, we are, you know, you can see this uh, gear box that I drew here. You can think about, this is like everybody riding bicycle uh, to work knows that, you know, the gear has to work on the bike uh, and it allow you to climb the hill or coming down the hill. And those, those gears are manageable. You can think, you know, you can visualize, but what I'm draw drawing the gear is a 10, 10, six to one, meaning you have a little laser gear that's spinning like tremendously fast because just because laser frequency is so much higher than microwave. But mm -hmm. the, the key point is as, I, is, as I rotate these gears, not a single tooth is being missed. Mm -hmm. Every single tooth matters. And that means it's everything is a phase coherent. I see. Throughout. And so ideally this translation allow you to go back and forth between different frequency regions. The fractional frequency stability is always the same. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. I have sure. a quick, quick question. Now, how would you isolate two of the teeth to beat them on a photo detector? You can, uh, there are many different ways to do it. Uh, in fact, uh, you, you know, you can, for example, you can select a photo detector to be responsible for the fifth harmonic. And so every fifth harmonic, they will beat against each other. And it does not necessarily, okay, actually let me draw this. You know, every fifth, every fifth harmonic. And the, 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 the detector is not necessarily picking up the, you know, the, this pair, rather it's responsible, it's, it's responding to every fifth pairs of the combs and they all coherently add up. And so when you say, well, they coherent add up, meaning they are sinusoidal wave all has to be in phase. And that's exactly true. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's a remarkable device. Okay, is that, okay? Is that good, Storm? Yes, thank you. Uh, let me go back to this. Um, so I was just telling you a little bit of the ingredient on the light side. Now, let, let me tell you a little bit on the atom side for the atomic clock. Um, so you have heard plenty of discussions now in the summer school of using the laser light to create traps for atom. And most of the time you hear is this, uh, you, you have an AC, the space variant AC stock shift by the laser light because atom is polarizable. So the atom, the, the frequency shift depends on the intensity distribution of the laser and you create the trapping potentials look like for the ground state atoms. Oftentimes, if you're not careful, the excited state could be creating a trapping potential that's quite different from the ground state. And if you're not careful, the, the, the excited state is in fact anti-trapping. But by carefully selecting uh, based on the atomic properties and the laser wavelength, you can now actually create tracks where both the ground state and the excited, one of the excited state, for example, the, the, the clock laser, uh, clock state, triple P0, they can have the same form of a stock shift between, between these two states. Therefore, the differentially speaking, the energy wise, these atoms can be trapped in these uh, optical um, ball trapping potentials, and you don't have to suffer a differential energy shift 
between the single accelerator and triple P-zero. That's actually a key ingredient to make atomic clock, optical atomic clock, where you can trap atoms because you have to have such a long coherence time. You have to keep the atoms in front of you for a long, long time. They cannot moving around. They cannot be moving around. They have to, with respect to the observer, yourself, they have to be stationary and, 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 and for many seconds. And so this being able to probe atoms when they're being trapped is a, is a key uh, important ingredient for the modern optical atomic clocks. And, and once you find the traps like this is actually the first generation of clocks, a very simple, you can just using a laser light, retroreflected and creating a, a stack of a pancakes, atoms can be confined in these pancakes and you, and you get your one dimensional optical lattice clock going already. Okay, so it's very simple. Um, and you know one uh, one key aspect of trapping atoms is to quantizing the Doppler effect because otherwise the atoms are moving around and you have all know the known about Doppler effect. And so here shows the dramatic impact of trapping. If these atoms are cooled down to already a micro Kelvin temperatures, but because of the laser wavelength is so small, you know it's very easy to have a Doppler effect when you have an optical photons probing atomic motion. Even at a fine microcarbon, the Doppler motion still broadens the atomic transition to tens of kilohertz. And that's not acceptable because that we are we are talking about millihertz language, and here you have tens of kilohertz. So by trapping them just in this one-dimensional trap I described earlier, you can start to see the wave function start to localize, and you can see the atomic transition line shapes start to mod be modified. And if you get a little bit of deeper trap, you, you actually form the so-called carrier transition, and you have two side bands emerging. This side bands gets pushed further, further out as the trap gets deeper and deeper. And turns out this is nothing but using the, the laser to probe the carrier transitions. And at the same time, the carrier transition is where there's no Doppler effect. And where did the Doppler effect go? It went into upper side band and lower side band. And that's because the motional degrees of freedom has been quantized. And so the atom cannot moving around in a continuous fashion as different discrete motional states. So from the from the motional state of the electronic ground state, it can be excited to the electronic excited state with motional degrees of freedom unchanged, which is a carrier, lowered, which is a red side band, or enhanced, which is the upper side band. If the atom's been cooled down to the quantum mechanical ground state, then there is no motional states of minus one. Therefore, the, the so-called red side band disappears. All, all you have is a blue side band. So that tells you the temperature of the atom confining the lattice. And you probably have heard about this, but if you were not making those connections, here's the connection. Here's how you probe the motional degrees of freedom of atoms being made in this artificial crystal of light that you would create in the lab. <coughs> Yes, I think um, Antoine gave a little bit of, of this uh, red band and blue side band a little bit in his lecture, yes, um, just yeah. briefly. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I want to say, now, once you know what's going on, and that, 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 that it's always true, once you know what the distribution and so on, then you can find a way to control it. So, for example, Antoine may tell you about blue side band, red side band, and when he probably told you of a cooling, side band cooling, all you are doing is to drive this, you know, uh, drive on this uh, red side band to the, remove atoms which are in the higher motional degrees of freedom in the ground state. As you go to the, 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 the higher electronic states, the atom can spontaneously decay and they go back down to the most, lower motional states. And by doing so, you can preferentially remove all the atoms, cool them down from higher motional degrees of freedom to, to the lower. Uh, motional states eventually to the ground state. And that, we do that as well in the clock. So here's, here's all the ingredients you needed. You have atoms that enjoy the very long coherence time, ground excited state. You now quantize their emotional degrees of freedom uh, in, in the quantum mechanical ground state. And you remove the Doppler effect. You remove the photon recoil effect you remove the trapping light shift effect because you made those trap to be matching with each other between the ground excited state. And then you can confine many, many atoms in there and that therefore achieving very high signal to noise ratio for the clock. 
And in doing so, you know, we, over the past 10 years, we were able to make a dramatic enhancement of the coherence in the system going from 10 years ago, for example, here's a Rabi line shape looks like five hertz wide to something today, we can have a Rabi line shape with excitation nearly 100% with a line with on the order of a few hundred megahertz. And that's not even the, the very best. So, so you can see this, all the ingredients coming together for building the atomic clock. And actually because of a limited time, I'm going to let Anna Maria's lecture to tell you all about SUN physics. I'm going to pass through this uh, really fast because I don't have time to tell you really, except that to give you the prelude or advertisement of Anna Maria's uh, theory work that really connected this quantum antibody physics of spin interactions. When I have multiple atoms confined in this little pancake and I have a pancake after pancake, you have dozens of atoms on each pancake and they can inter interact with each other. To understand that, uh, I please do not miss Anna Maria's talk. Uh, and, it, and through that collaboration with her, allowed us to understand these many body physics. And, and it, this was the way for us, for the 1B system, um, give us the inspiration of either you go for 3D or you build a different 1B system where the spin-spin interaction can be controlled, can be mitigated, and so on for the clock. And I'm going to tell you a, a little bit of a story on that end. So the first thing is, well, since within that each pancake, the atoms are interacting. And sometimes that's, that is exactly the physics you want to study. Like when I told you about the molecules, right? Each pancake, you got the molecules, they have a dipolar interaction. And the, it, it all depends on what sort of a physics you want to study and what do you find it to be really interesting. Um, in that case, you know, with the spin-spin the interactions in the strontium system in this 1D pancakes, itself is very interesting, allow us to understand interacting fermions, the spin interactions and the spin many body physics, spin squeezing. But on the other hand, if we, I want to build scalable quantum uh, uh, system with as many atoms as I possibly can to pack in the system, well, perhaps the one way to solve the problem of spin spin interaction is to just build a 3D lattice where each atom is because they are fermions, only one atom goes into one side. And if you build 100 by 100 by 100 sort of a cubic lattice, you will have a huge number of atoms confining there with long coherence time. That would give you this mind boggling measurement precision of few parts 10 to minus 20 in one, at one second averaging time. Three orders of magnitude higher measurement precision than what we hold as a record back in 2019, three times 10 to minus 17. And of course, as we speak right now, this record is being shattered. We have an immediate improvement of fact of 10 already this year. So it's already now the record is three times and four times 10 minus 18 at one second. Still, we have a three, two orders of magnitude to go if we can realize quantum systems like this. Adam Kaufman uh, will give a talk also on using tweezers for quantum metrology. And uh, this effort is being probably Antoine's talk already gave you a, a very good preparation for the tweezer experiment uh, platforms. And Adam Kaufman, when he come to give a talk in the summer school, he will talk about quantum metrology of using tweezer systems where atoms individually confined in optical tweezer arrays and use this as a clock atom just like in the 3D lattice. Okay, and uh, again, I'm going to pass on the SUN symmetry thing for Anna Maria, uh, but it, except to tell you this, this aspect that in the previous 1D lattice, I showed that emotional degrees of freedom is all quantized, right? You see those side bands. Now you've got atoms in three-dimensional space. Well, obviously you still have the emotional degrees of freedom that's been quantized now in three dimensions. So you can see X, Y, Z, three different spatial axes. You have a blue sideband and you have a zero red sideband indicating the atoms in three dimensions are being confined in the lowest emotional ground state as indicated by this cartoon here. But another really important advance of, of a 3D lattice is actually not only the Doppler motion is being quantized, the interaction itself is actually quantized. Why do I say that? Well, if I have atoms, turns out the, the, the nuclear spin in strontium-87 is nine half. So if you have, you could in principle have 10 different nuclear spin states of atoms, 
And if you have all of them into a single color, they have a P-wave interaction because they're identical. If they have different nuclear spins, you can have S-wave interaction. Remember, this was what I covered in my first lecture with molecules. In, in a, in, you know, the nuclear spin can act as a, an internal sort of a, a identifier of, of who you are. And so if you are not identical, you can have uh, interactions of S-wave. You no longer have this so-called poly exclusion principle. And therefore, the atoms of different colors can reside together in the lo lowest emotional ground state. If that's the case, they can interact. But when they interact, we can actually see the interaction energies is well separated from the carrier where it does not have interactions. So immediately, this gives you the possibility of, OK, when I do precision metrology, even if I have defects, I have atoms, atoms with different nuclear spins sprinkling into my three-dimensional optical lattice. And you worry about these interaction effects. Well, these interaction effects have been quantized away so that the central carrier is Doppler-free and interaction-free. Okay. And so this allows us now to chase the fast atom light coherence. Uh, this example shows uh, we can now push the coherence time to 12 seconds, the Q factor of one times 10 to the 16 instead of one times 10 to the 17, we're still a factor of 10 to go. But that at the time in 2019, this is a record coherence time that we have ever achieved between light and the matter and, and, the, and, the, and also uh, different portions of atoms inside of the optical lattice. And it turns out this was actually limited by the fact that the lattice was a little too deep. And, and so it turns out there's a photon scattering effect going on. And what we want to move on to study to further improve this quantum coherence is to make the trap uh, shallower and shallower. But when, uh, when the trap becomes shallower, they can tunnel, the atoms can tunnel back and forth between, between these uh, optical lattice trapping sites. And one way to solve this problem is to build an uh, an optical lattice system where the site, the di distance between di uh, various different sites and the laser that's probing the optical transitions will have the same scale of a wavelength, uh, same scale of uh, yeah uh, 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 of of the length scale. You know the wavelengths you're probing the, the clock transition and the trapping that you're using to trap these atoms, you want them to ideally to be matched such that when atom, even when the atom can tunnel back and forth, they will still ac accumulate the same phase shift because the wavelengths you're probing the clock and the, the position difference between the atoms as they, as they hop back and forth between the trapping sites are exactly matched. And these are the ideas that we're working on. Sorry, June, there is a question in the chat. Garrett, maybe you can unmute yourself uh, and ask it. Yeah, um, sure. I was just going to ask um, about uh, what might maybe limit the coherence time. I guess uh, I, I was trying to think about whether or not it was the result of the fine structure constant being really small. And so maybe light matter interactions are just inherently weak. Is this why the coherence time is limited between uh, driving the atoms transitions with light? Uh, what do you mean the fine structure constant being uh, too small? Well, I guess maybe I'm not thinking about this correctly, but I guess I, I always imagined like a, an intuition for the fine structure constant being something that parameterizes light matter interactions and it being like one over 137, uh, I think, uh, and I think there's like a factor somewhere where it's squared. So it's one over 137 squared or something like this. So it's a really, really small number. And so I was just trying to think about whether or not this could affect um, the coherence of a of, uh, driving an atomic transition with light. You're actually uh, asking a pretty deep question. Uh, you know that you are right. Alpha is you know is a number that QED pioneers who, like Feynman, you know, used to always say alpha is the is a, is a number characterized the photon uh, electron interaction, right? Um, and and 
the, the, the way that we scale the normalized alpha out of the system here is in some sense, alpha is already part of the story of telling you how long the lifetime of these excited state atoms are living. If, if the alpha had been bigger, the, the lifetime would have been shorter because of the coupling state. It just becomes stronger. Okay, so, so that fundamental constant is part of the story of the, how the light and the matter interaction, you're, you're interacting, you're absolutely correct. But in the, in the experiment, what we are trying to do is I want to send a photon in to probe, uh, and you know, I make a coherent superposition between the ground and the excited state. And I want to see how long it's living there. I want to ideally want to approach the fundamental limit set by the alpha that you mentioned. That, that nature has already given us the lifetime of say 160 seconds for triple P zero state. Why can't I approach that? And turns out there's something else that's limiting us. And it, you know, one of the limiting factor is what I drew here. This light, the photon that we confine the atoms has consequences. I told you only the good things about, oh, I can make the traps such that they are matched in the polarizability and so on between the ground excited state. But turns out these 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 light are, are tremendously detuned away from the resonance of atom, but they still through through you know alpha resonance interactions like Rayleigh really scattering like you have heard about, they can still have the uh, the effect where the atomic structure will scatter off the confinement light of the lattice. After all, they're living in the lighthouse. So, so they, they're living there all this time and they uh, just a little bit of feeb feeble uh, interaction with the light that's confining them can lead to the consequences of they being excited somewhere else virtually and decay down to a state other than the original state you wanted them to be living in. And that alone can destroy the quantum coherence that you're, you're the quantum pendulum that you started swinging early on. So is this a result of the, um, is this a result of the atom just, of, I, I guess I kind of understand how the trap light can sort of, even though it's off resonant, it can still interact with the atom to a very small extent and over a very small uh, distribution. But I guess is, I would be more inclined to believe that the fluctuation would be due to maybe like a deviation in the frequency of the lattice light. Is this also something that can limit the coherence? Excellent. That's another excellent question. And turns out, we, yeah, we worry about those effects and we, we study those. It turns out that the detuning is not that important. That's because you are already, your light is already detuned away from resonance by, by terahertz, you know. And so if you fl fluctuate on the order of few kilohertz or few gigahertz, it just doesn't matter because you're already so far detuned. The frequency of the fluctuation matters a lot when you approach resonance. If you're on resonance and you 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 fluctuate back and forth by a few uh, kilohertz, could matter a lot. But since you are already so far detuned, the fluctuation actually doesn't matter. The intensity could matter. I see. But these are the yeah these are the questions we do ask ourselves. What what's limiting it? And then you through this, you study you know the effect that you mentioned. We can actually answer that by doing experiment. You know, you can move the frequency around. You can even put a modulation on it uh, and move the, you know, jitter, the put a white noise on it. And so that the, the frequency is actually fluctuating quite a bit and, and or at a different rates of fluctuation, we can modify this, you know. And, it, and so use this, you can actually see how how is this frequency noise that can affect the coherence? Does it have an impact or not? Or we can do something else, and this is all part of the experimental investigation. So, are these? Can... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, so uh, are these are these considerations that you make whenever you're trying to decide how to improve the trap? Like, if you want to make the trap deeper, you can either do so by approaching resonance closer or by increasing the intensity. But you see fluctuations in both of these degrees. No, you see intensity fluctuations as well as frequency fluctuations. So, yeah, actually, you cannot move the trap frequency closer to the resonance. You, you are correct. If you want to make a trap deeper, you can make the uh, frequency closer to the to the resonance on on some other electronic transitions. But it, this will deviate away from this magic condition where the ground state and the excited state, the clock state have the same polarizability. 
And so, so we don't actually have that freedom. But in ordinary traps, in a, suppose you're not building this magical wavelength trapping, but you're just building up for the iPod trap, then you're right. As you get closer, you'll get a deeper trap. However, you actually always lose because the, the photon scattering rate scales more unfavorably as you get closer to resonance. So oftentimes you want to hear people talk about off resonance dipole traps, the further away from resonance, the better. Yes. And, 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 and so in, in the end, people just play games on making the uh, tiny uh, focus so the intensity is large enough and get lots of power. You know, that's why we have 100 watt lasers being you know, used to be cutting stainless steel plates but we're using them to trap uh, atoms in the middle of the vacuum chamber. This was useful, thank you. If you put any ordinary material in the middle of the focus of a 100 watt laser, it would be, it, it will, they will melt. <laughs> but <laughs> but that, that tells you how, how precise AMO physics is. The atoms have very, very structured atomic resonances. So by avoiding those resonances, atoms do not melt away. They do not get ionized. They actually get trapped in a, at a temperature of 10 nano Kelvin. This is something I always feel fascinating. This is something I always feel like, like when you tell your mom, you know, this is a laser you can use to cut uh, 10 centimeter thick stainless steel plate. And uh, no, I'm using this mom, not for cooking the stainless steel plate, but to trap atoms with temperature that's the coldest spot in the universe. Your mom, you talk to your mom, she will always find that fascinating. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think the time is already coming up. And I, I, I think I was in, you know, building a better insulator clock. Maybe I will end by telling you about, we learned about all this you know, quantum coherence. And what is the next thing we want to do? Right now, the, the, the best measurement precision we have achieved is in 2019 still, at the, at the time, six times 10 to minus 19 in one hour. And just to give those numbers into your, into your brain. On, on the surface of the earth, if you move your watch up and down by one centimeter, there is a gravitational redshift. The time slows down, speeds up as the clock moves up and down. One centimeter will give you 10 to minus 18 shift. Okay, just remember that number. One centimeter equals to 10 to minus 18 redshift. And that's a small, small number. People know about that redshift, right? Uh, Einstein proposed that theory more than 100 years ago. In the 60s, people tested this with clocks in space with satellites, because satellites, you can move clock up and down by tens of kilometers. Okay, so you can measure things at 10 to minus 14, 10 to minus 13 level of shift. Moving clock by one centimeter and see the time being different is a fairly dramatic. And so that's why 10 to minus 18, once you reach the level of 10 to minus 18 measurement precision, you can say, well, now I can test GR. Well, it's not, it's more than just testing GR. You can now use this to actually measure the geo activities on earth. And so, so six times 10 to minus 19 in one hour, that was a couple of years ago. <coughs> we have a new strong team one system. Again, learning from all these qu protecting quantum coherence and so on. And I just want to show you that now the coherence, instead of 10 seconds or 12 seconds, it's now 42 seconds. And with this kind of a coherence, you can go back and look at the, the, the measurement precision of the clock. This is actually the image of the atomic cloud that's about millimeter long, vertical scale, millimeter long. We can now start to measure uh, the gravitational redshift within this crowd. Okay, that's because we can achieve measurement precision of few plus 10 to minus 18 at a second. And we can average it down to two times 10 to minus 20. One millimeter, remember one centimeter, the redshift is 10 to minus 18. One millimeter, the redshift is 10 to minus 19. And we start to map this. And I think it's tremendously exciting, right? A single atomic ensemble you start to see time is actually different. It's not quite yet at the level where a single De Broglie wavelength, you will see time is different. But what if we get to that point? Um, 
where the, you can you hear so much about many body physics that you heard in the summer school. What if we continue to make the advance such that the time and the space coordinates are no longer easily separable in the flat space, but rather you have to really think about curved space. What about the entanglement and so on in this, in this kind of a regime where the clock can't actually allow you to probe this? Remember the gravitational redshift is a universal actor. It acts on center of mass, it acts on spin, it acts on everything. It's not, that's a fundamentally different from a field gradient, like a magnetic field gradient. It does not care about your spatial degrees of freedom, but cares about no, spin degrees of freedom and so on. But gravitational potential acts on all of those because of the general, general relativity. So, so I think I'm going to end here. I was going to tell you a little bit about using clock to do dark matter search, but the time is up. Uh, I want to thank the group and thank uh, many collaborators over the years. And, and of course, don't forget to tune in for Anna Maria's uh, lecture. Thanks. Great, thank you, June, for the great, great lecture. And we have some time for discussion. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So uh, as these clocks become more and more precise, uh, at some point, if you're measuring the uh, time down to gravitational dilations of like sub micron levels or perhaps even smaller, it seems like there might be fundamental limits on how precisely you could even measure the time on Earth because of all the various fluctuations and fields. So I wonder if there's like some fundamental like Earth scale limit or if we'll be able to keep modeling that away and pushing it further and further. Yeah. yeah um, no, excellent question. I, th I think on Earth, for example, the clock we have right now is already limited by the Earth geoactivity. If I want to compare my clock here in border with a clock somewhere in on, on European continent uh, or on Asian continent, there's already a tremendous technical uh, difficulty of connecting those geo potentials together. So, so when I say clock here stable in border, I'm talking about clock comparisons within border, and then we actually have to start to worry about the Rocky Mountain. You know, you, unfortunately, you guys are not in border. You're not in the setting up where you can see the mountains. So if you look, if you hike one mile west, you will see the mountains. And those mountains will be distorting the, the geo potential of Boulder, Colorado, to a point where the time will be intrinsically connected to space. So you're right. At, at one micron scale, if you get to the one micron scale, your clock is so noisy because of the geo activities. Like it's like a, taking your pendulum clock into a rough ocean, and you know, good luck with a pendulum clock. So. But it, uh, so on one hand, that's that. But it, on the other hand, you can say, well, quantum mechanics wise, as long as it can maintain, and in my laboratory, we could make maintain relatively stable, relative speaking, gravitational potential between the two clocks, you can still push the effort forward of seeing what is the limit of measuring time. Uh, that we know Planck time scale is 10 to minus 34. That's way, way beyond what we can do right now. And there will, there will be gravitational, you know, is it possible you can really start to see the gra gravitational physics that's merging in with quantum mechanics? Not, a, not yet quantum gravity. I don't think, quant you know, in my strict uh, thinking about quantum gravity is like when you have to really have to deal with uh, quantization of the gravitational waves, you know, you have to talk about gravitons. But if you just want to see gravitational waves have an impact on the, on the atoms and so on, I don't think, uh, you know, micron would be enough. You probably will have to go down to a ball radius kind of a scale where the gravitational uh, effect is actually coupling into fundamental, uh, the time dilation. And that's still many orders of magnitude. And if you get to, the, no, let's see. We are right now at a millimeter scale. You can see gravitational effect. If you go down to, nanometer scale, that's a six orders of magnitude. That's 10 to minus six, right? And that, that would take your clock to 10 to minus 25, 10 to minus 26. At that point, I actually talked to some of the astronomy people. They said there's a stochastic gravitational waves, things that the universe has bubbles going on with all the black holes popping. 
and there will be stochastic gravitational waves. And this is actually a very poetic analogy. That our universe is a lively bubble, like ocean. It's, a, it's just going up and down, up and down, and your clock will be, at the time, sensitive to that. And maybe that's the end of our clockmakers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to be it's going to be dictated by the universe that we're living in. Is there any special significance when the the time dilation scale approaches the wavelength of the lasers that you're using to probe? Um, yeah, I think the the I think it would be really interesting rather than the wavelength of the probe. But I would say, you know, when the atoms are cooled down to this so-called quantum degeneracy, the de Broglie wavelength and uh, an optical wavelength tends to come together. And, and and that's because when, you know, uh, we look at the uh, optical lattice, for example, when you have a unity filling, often means that optical, uh, this de Broglie wavelength of each individual atom that's cooled to sufficiently low temperatures start to overlap with each other. Uh, and so from that point of view, if over the one WRU wavelength or as atom can be placed in a coherent superposition of left and right or whatever that's being described by the one WRU wavelength, and you have to think about the time scale being different. That, that is what the significance is, I think, when, you, when the capability approaches the wavelength scale. More questions? Yeah, I had a question about uh, like distribution. Like, I mean, so you you've made and, and have like you know the, the most stable laser in the world. You have the best atomic clock in, in the world. Uh, how do uh, how do how do you distribute this information? How do people come and like compare their clocks to you? And like you know, if somebody wants to make this network in space to make this kind of telescope, like how does how does all of that work? Uh, do people in suits and sunglasses and briefcases like our briefcases come over? Or, um... yeah. Yeah, ac yeah, excellent question. Uh, this I'm, I'm showing this slide. Uh -huh. That's because we are hitting that limit. You know, how do you compare those clocks? So fortunately in Boulder, um, it, it, you know, this is actually where we are. Leo and Anna Maria and me, we are all in this. Well, Leo is actually technically in this office here, uh, the physics, <laughs> and that, that office uh, is the Jella. And, yeah. and uh, so we have the atomic clock on campus here, and there's, there's a, about a mile away um, to the west, to the southwest of us is the, is the NIST campus, and mm -hmm. they have a couple of atomic clocks there. How do you compare, even within, even within border? So we lay the fibers around the, underneath the, the broadway that connects us, and the fibers can transfer information from Jella to, to NIST and back. And that allowed us to connect clocks, to compare them at the, you know, this action, in fact, it was just published earlier this year to be able to compare the clocks. Now well, you're, you're saying my clock is good at to this level. You're, you're saying my clock is better or whatever. Well, let's compare them. And the one way to do that is connecting them through fibers and to get and the fiber is not an ordinary fiber we actually cancel all the noise on this fiber. You know, have you heard about using fiber to eavesdrop other people's conversation? <laughs> and the <laughs> fiber is actually an incredible sensitive device. And we, we on this hit here, we do not want to listen to any conversation. We would rather to cancel all the conversation. So it's dead quiet. Uh, and that we have the technology to do that. But what's really limiting is what if I want to compare the clocking border to the one that you have Mm -hmm. In Wisconsin, uh, oh, you are not in Wisconsin. You are in yes. Illinois. Yes. Or yes. The, to to the one in Wisconsin, to the one in DC, to the one in Europe, to the one in Asia. That yeah. is a big problem. You cannot lay the fibers all the way across the entire Earth to do so. Right. And uh, there is a research group, Nate Newberry's group in Nest, starting to develop the technology called Airborne. You can see there's a picture on this slide. Mm -hmm. There's a free space link. It's really fun. Like you set up a telescope, you shoot 1.5 micron lasers between the top of the building. Actually, we did do that experiment in the Duan physics. We had to make a fiber connection from my lab all the way to the Duan physics. <coughs> and then we shoot, and then you shoot the laser beam from one of the, the 10th floor windows to the, the top floor windows in this, on this campus. They receive with telescope. Throughout this whole process, you have to cancel all the noise, even during the air turbulence and so on. 
Mm -hmm. And this technology is now being proven to work at 10 to minus 18 level. Um, it, and, but the distance is only a kilometer. Right. Uh, I think the key is to see the scale, scalability of the technology that Nate is talking about, possible collaboration where you can fly balloons and we can send laser beams from the lab to the balloon and so on. Because if that works, if you can overcome 10 kilometer distance, then you can go to space. You can like shoot laser beam to satellite that's 10 kilometer above the atmosphere. And once you're getting into the atom above the atmosphere, you're all home free. There mm -hmm. will be no more perturbations. And so I think this will be actually a key technology that got to be developed if you want to realize the vision of the clock networks in space. Because as some of you pointed out, clock on Earth, eventually we're going to lose our confidence in it. The clock has to live in space in the end. Thank you. Excellent. Great. So I, I have a question about the magic wavelength trap. Yeah. Uh, so in, in the past, like we've we've accounted for magic wavelength, including like sidebands from an EOM or something like that. And in there, because you have different frequencies that have different polarizabilities, at least near resonance. Uh, we can get like magic traps that are not like single wavelength or single frequency magic traps. And I wonder with the, uh, with the precision that you can get with this, uh, with the frequency comb, uh, what kind of like interesting, uh, you know, multi-tone traps have you guys uh, investigated or thought about? Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a, certainly a really good idea. Um, the, let me put this way: the, the idea of a magical wavelength really was is established in the 1990s. Uh, Actually, you know, again, if you, if I name some names, you wouldn't be surprised. Like Peter Zoller, it was very early on they wrote a paper. Actually, Peter was still in Jilla when the initial idea of discussion of uh, or cancellation of AC structure can happen. And that early days, the discussion was very simple. You just use two different lasers with different color, you must be able to cancel it, right? You know, if you have two different colors and you have two different degrees of freedom, you can tune the relative wavelengths between the two colors, you can cancel everything. And, and so that was, I think it was a bit naive, however, um, on the experimental front, if you have two, two or three different colors of the wavelength lasers, you'll know the biggest challenge is to overlap them because they will always have a little minute vibrations with respect to each other. It's just, and that's really, really difficult. So the, the idea of using EOM sideband, that's good because you have a single beam that will allow you to do, um, you don't have to worry about the relative motions between two different colors, but the, but the power, however, between the two beams is quite limited. Um, with the frequency combs, unfortunately, how, you know, you know it, it's powerful, but it, it's difficult to say, well, I only want two or three components to be working. I don't want to get rid of the rest. It's not easily uh, doable. And you can, you can maybe go through some optical filters and so on to eventually allow you to have two or three components with a relatively equal magnitude of power. And the power needs to be relatively large, a few watts or something to create its optical traps. All of that, I'm just saying that, no, these ideas, theoretically, you can think about these ideas are all good ones. Practically, uh, I still, uh, you know, the, this idea of being able to use one wavelength, they no, you never have to worry about it's a pointing stability. Of course, the pointing stability in the end will cause Doppler effect, and we have ways to solve that. But at least you don't have to worry about the relative motion of between two colors that causing emotional heating of the atoms or emotional dephasing of the atoms. That's removed. So, so I can only tell you that that so far the most effective approach in the lab has been the single color magical wavelength idea. I'm not ruling out, you know, <laughs> you're willing to try uh, and multiple lasers can be integrated onto the, you know, you, you might even say, well, multiple lasers, I can merge them on a piece of fiber and just then have them come out. The problem is whenever they have a different colors, they have a so-called chromatic aberrations and they will never focus on the same location 
the fiber tip, if it's vibrating, the different colors can have a little different diffraction angle. So all of these effects are still there. And it, and also, never mind, the intensity match would have to be incredibly good because you're relying on relative um, polarizability to cancel each other. So the intensity match would have to be, many, I'm talking about 18 digits kind of a matching, right? So just think about that, that challenge. Great. So I think let's then let June to, to rest I, and all of you go to have a lunch break and thank him for again for the very nice lecture. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, June. Thank you very much. And we go back to the to the lecture at, at 2 p.m. And and if you I mean if you I mean this is also your time for looking at posters and everything because on Wednesday we have the other poster session. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye bye.